in the midst of these extraordinary times, throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you the authors and their new books. This is the part where usually if we were in the store, I would point to a big beautiful stack of Sigrid's new book by our registers. But as you can see, this is not the store. Um, and there are no registers here. So if you can please, please support the store by purchasing a book online. We have tons and tons of copies of What Are You Going Through that we would love to ship to you. Um, to make it super, super easy at any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase What Are You Going Through on Politics and Prose's website. Additionally, there will be a Q&A at the end of this. Um, you can ask the author a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. While we don't have time to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't have time. We will try to get to everyone's questions. We apologize if we don't have time to get to yours. Uh, finally, we wanna thank you for being here with us today. We are so, so grateful for our loyal customers, keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Joining us is Sigrid Nunes, whose most recent book has maybe the most relatable title of 2020, What Are You Going Through? It is a story of a woman who agrees to help her terminally ill friend by seeing her through her last days. Sigrid is the author of several books, including The Friend, which won the 2018 National Book Award in Fiction, and she is joining us from New York City. We are so grateful to have Curtis Sittenfeld in conversation with Sigrid. Curtis is the author of many novels, most recently the novel Rodham, uh, which imagines a certain Hillary if she had not become a Clinton. Please welcome Sigrid and Curtis to PNP Live. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Lindsay. And um, Sigrid, this is this is so exciting. I know I feel um, when I've gotten to do a few of these conversations with other writers, I feel like it's such a privilege. And I have to say, because I'm sure there are so many people who are so excited and would like to say this to you directly, but I'm the one who gets to talk to you. I have to say congratulations on the publication of your wonderful, wonderful novel, which which um, I, I, I'm sure everyone has seen it, but here's a little visual. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited. I'll just, I'll basically, I think I'll just get to the questions, but um, unless, is there anything, is there anything you'd like to say before I start, you know, no, interrogating you? Thank you very much for what you just said. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So obviously Lindsay just gave a sort of brief summary. Um, of the book, but I, I do always like to hear in, an, in you know, a, a writer's own words. If, if someone said, um, oh, you, you have a new novel, you know, what's it about? How would you describe it? Um, you know, as you know, that's actually a, a, a hard question because it, it you know, unless, unless you have a, there's a, a, a sort of very specific um, uh, thing that you, I mean, you know, because you books are about different things. So it is true, as Lindsay was saying, that um, at the heart of it, there is this friendship between these two women, and one of uh, one of them has received a diagnosis of terminal cancer, and uh, she does need help. She does need somebody to go away with her for a while while she takes care of last things and be with her um, towards the end. Uh, but it. You know, but I think of it. I, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't start out that way. Um, that that character, that woman, is just one person uh, that the narrator is talking about and thinking about in the beginning of the book. So it's really, it's it's also about the narrator's encounters that she has with various people in her life, and some of them are just really sort of glancing. There, there. She's in a bar. She overhears a conversation taking place behind her. She tells that story. Uh, she goes to the gym, and she hears and 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 uh, one of her gym buddies, whom she's seen for years, there starts a monologue about uh, how she feels about her her looks changing and her weight issues and so on. And that goes on for 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 like ha half the book. And in that half, there is also this old friend of hers that she's gone to visit in the hospital before she, when she's received a, a, a diagnosis of cancer, but not terminal, when she's in treatment. And then that narrows down uh, where that particular character and what she's going through becomes the, 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 the central uh, story. But everybody that is mentioned, every, every encounter that this narrator has 
it seems to be about somebody who's going through something that might seem minor compared to terminal cancer, but there's a certain intensity in how that person presents what they're going through. And the narrator is passive to some extent. She's just, she's a listener. She's a listener to these stories. And then she records those stories for the, for the reader. Um, I, feel like, I feel like that's an excellent, <laughs> very thorough um, summary. So what, I guess this is sort of a two part question. When did you start writing this and why is this the book that you wrote now? Like, were you choosing among other topics or did you, you know, was this inside of you for a while? Was it relatively recent that you, you sort of decided that this was your, your newest novel? I started writing it in the summer um, of 2017, actually. Um, and I didn't really, I didn't have a plan. Um, I usually don't when I start, when I start writing a book. In fact, I, I, I you know, what I, what I do is I just try to start somewhere with something. And in this particular case, it came to me to write, I went to hear a man give a talk you know, and you know how it is, you write a sentence and then you've sort of committed yourself to something, right? Like, who is this I? Who is this man? What was this talk? Where are they? Why did she go? Um, is she in her hometown or is she somewhere else? Well, I decided she should be somewhere else. Well, if she's somewhere else, why is she somewhere else? I decided she was visiting a friend in the hospital. So that by that time I had three characters and, uh, you know, and two different situations. And so I just kept writing, you know, I just kept, you know, I, I had a sense of, of what kind of tone I wanted. Um, I certainly had, you know, an idea about the narrative voice because I, it, it, that seemed to come right out of the friend. I knew from the very beginning that it was the same voice, the same tone, the same kind of intimate atmosphere. Um, so, you know, I just, I just kept writing. And given that that's what I was doing, you know, writing, writing every day and moving this story along, um, I had to, you know, I, I thought of certain things. There were certain things on my mind and they came up as I was writing. And then I found a way to, to, to make, you know, one, one work out of that, out of those separate str strands. But I didn't really have a, I didn't really have a plan in, in the beginning. And so I actually am curious when you're talking about, you know, this has a sort of similar tone to the friend, is this literally the same narrator or like, is this in any way a sequel or not at all? Well, you know, it, it, this has come up a few times, even though I don't think of it as a sequel, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's not, but I do absolutely feel that it came right out of the friend. And that it's a, it, you know, it's like a companion piece. Yeah. But there's the, it's um, uh, whatever the, however the narrator behaves and however she observes the world and ha however she responds to things out there are recognizably the same way the narrator of the friend would, would have done. Mm -hmm. So I do, I do think it's the same, it's the same narrator, it's the same, um, sensibility mm -hmm. and the same way of looking at the world um again i didn't i didn't think of that before i started writing but as soon as i was writing i i did realize i was in that familiar territory again and do you um i don't know if this is premature but do you feel at all like this this sensibility like could be a trilogy like is is there is there more <laughs> I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean because it does. Because as you, as you know, as we said, it's it's not a sequel, but there's something about it that yeah, yeah I, do, I do feel that that you know, if that were to happen again, the worry is since I didn't begin either of those books with a plan, um, you know, it's hard for me. This way, it would feel like a plan, <laughs> and then then maybe it it wouldn't come right. Um, but I actually can. Also, the two books are, you know, similar in length. They're about the same length. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can, I can imagine that, that there could be another book that would be, you know, that you would say, well, that those make a kind of trilogy, don't, don't they?
yeah and and yeah like and and also i mean and i i think you write about this in such a sort of um poignant and but unsentimental way like also you know the theme of death is certainly you know very present in in both of them um so did did you feel like um like the friend was sort of did that feel like a stylistic departure to you from your earlier work or not particularly like just in terms well, of the, the the language well you know when I finished the friend and it wasn't until I finished the book um it occurred to me that I had you know without really being conscious of it that I had gone back to my own first book because my my first book again that's that's the same narrator i realized that 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 was the that's, oh, that's a coming of age book um but first of all it's it seems to me that that's that narrator young now in the friend was the same narrator much older but but again with the same sensibility and the same way of looking at the world and also interesting to me was that my first book is in four parts and the narrator is telling other people, except for one small part, is, is telling other people, talking about other people. She's giving mm -hmm. biographies of other people. First, she's writing about her father and then her mother. Then there's a section about ballet and then there's a section about a Russian immigrant that she met. But again, she's there, she's a character, she's a narrator. Um, it's memoir-like the way she tells these stories. But I think that's that you know is it you know reminded me a lot of um, what I'm doing now, where I'm talking about encounters that I've had. Those were you know those were uh, much more significant encounters as you my you know they they were based on my mother and my father. Um, but yeah, and then other books that I've read, you know, to some extent. I mean, uh, you know, when when I wrote a novel about a, a woman who had served as a as a U.S. Army nurse in Vietnam. I start out with a writer, uh, a narrator with whom I'm very identified, um, who's kind of having a bit of writer's block. And at a certain point, she with, she she withdraws as, as the center of attention in order to tell the story of that woman in Vietnam and what happened if she came, she came, after she came home from Vietnam. So again, it was there, and the the. Um, the narrative voice is also similar. It's just that in that book, so much of it is about something that has nothing to do with the narrative. I, I, I mean, the narrator had never been to Vietnam or, or, or had never been a nurse. Um, so the writer there, you know, takes on a smaller role. So yeah, so it's, it's um, you know, it's certainly something that, that's been there. But I, as I say, what, what really struck me was how much, I mean, that, that first book was published in 1995. And I'd been working on it for quite a bit before that, so it was really, really early work. Um, but, but, but it, but I, I feel like if I hadn't written that, neither the friend nor this book would have happened, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, well, as I'm sure many people listening to this know, um, the friend, you know, won the National Book Award um, in in 2018, and um, which as I imagine most people watching also know is, you know, one of the very biggest sort of literary prizes that exists. And was that um, life-changing or not particularly life-changing for you? Well, it, it wasn't. I mean, for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, that book, I finished that book in the, in the fall, in, in the summer of 2016. Okay. Right. So then I was already started on the new book in the summer of 2017. So that by the time the prize came in the fall of 2018, um, you know, I was I was really immersed in this new book. And that was my concern. So there was no nothing to, to, that would change anything there. And secondly, I had, you know, I, I um, I'd written I'd written seven novels in one memoir. Um, so you know, I think I think if that had happened after the particularly like after uh, after one book or even two, I think it would have had much more of an impact on on how I looked at, at writing and 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 so on. But but at this stage, not not really, not not really terribly uh, much. How I have to ask, how do you look at writing? <laughs> how do I look at writing? 
<laughs> just a little, a little light, superficial question. <laughs> what does writing mean to you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> seriously? I know. Um, well, no. Do you, do you want me to ask a more, a more answerable question? <laughs> ask a more answerable, answerable question. Um, well, I mean, I guess, I guess, um, one specific thing I was thinking about, and I was curious about, you know, when you had started writing, what are you going through? Um, was like, did it feel at all? Like, did the sort of attention that, that came along? And I mean, obviously, you've been a very well respected writer for a long time. Um, but but the sort of you know, particular intensity of, att of attention of winning that prize, like, did that feel like, did it, did it prevent you either like emotionally or just like logistically from being able to focus on writing or, or no? No, no. And, and as I say, I think that's because I was so already immersed in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'd been, I'd been working on it for such a long time, and I, I kind of, um, as I say, since it did seem to come out of the friend, I didn't, you know, I knew that there were similarities there, so I didn't have what, like, imagine if I'd been trying to write something completely different from the friend, then maybe I would have thought, oh, but, you know, those who like the friend are not going to like this, you know, that, 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 that kind of thing. Um, but you know, I just I felt I felt very comfortable with it at, the, at that time. Um, do you feel, in general, like you you know um, sort of who or maybe whom you're you're writing for? Like, are you writing for someone specific or someone like someone specific but imaginary? Or you know, primarily, are you in conversation with yourself? Like, do you feel conscious of that either? in the act of writing or like maybe as you're getting close to finishing a book? I, 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 I try to think about that. Like, do, you know, do, do I have a reader in mind or, you know, who am I, who am I, am I thinking of imagining when I write this, like who's reading it? And I don't really accept that, um, except that I, I am always assuming, and I can feel this, that, 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 that I'm writing for someone who will understand, first of all, you know, that, that you know, that, that I don't feel like I'm writing something where it's going to be very difficult to convince the reader of this or that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's somebody who really likes to read and who likes to read as much as I do mm -hmm. and who likes the kind of books that I do, you know? So again, it's a, um, I remember reading in a novel, a novel of Muriel Sparks, um, a far cry, a far cry from Kensington, I think it is, yeah, where, right. where, the, where the main, one of the main characters is a, um, is an editor, and she's advising uh, a, an inexperienced writer to, to write as if you were talking, write, write as if you were uh, writing a letter to a friend, and. Um, now this is friend. This friend is somebody who knows some things about you, but not everything about you. You don't have to tell them everything. You don't. You know, um, it's just a beautiful little passage, about a paragraph long. And and uh, you know, I thought, well, that I can I can see that. You know, I, I always feel like I'm writing, you know, to somebody who will understand. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing about that is that um, uh, when I was when I was first learning to write, I, I heard from different people, the you know, uh, uh, teachers. Uh, that uh, that I was being too explicit, but but they but they couldn't tell me how I was being too explicit or how to change it, right? So I didn't really I didn't really understand it, and then uh, you know and then I had, I had heard this other piece of advice: never never you know never make the mistake of uh, of thinking that the reader is not as intelligent as you are, mm. which is a great piece of advice. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started thinking that my reader. I'm going to have my reader be not only as not just as intelligent as I am, but more intelligent. Okay, so I'm writing to this very bright person, right? When I'm writing, and that actually fixed that problem of being too explicit. So I was very grateful for those two different, you know, pieces of advice which didn't come from the same source at all. But the idea was that I would write, then I would avoid uh, over-explaining um, and 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 treating the 
reader as though they wouldn't get certain things and repeating things that didn't need to be repeated. And then I would think when I was writing, oh, wait, wait, is that too, I mean, is, is the reader going to get that? And I think, oh, that brain, that, that, that <laughs> smart reader will get it. And then I always thought, well, and then if I'm wrong, you know, then the, then the editor is going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're going to have to make it a little clearer. And that didn't happen. I mean, that didn't happen because in fact, I, you know, um, I was being too explicit, obviously. And, and I, 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 I really changed that. So there's that too in, in, in who I think of when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm writing, when I'm trying to figure out whether or not I've said enough or it's clear enough or whatever. But that's a different kind of reader. Um, yeah, no, I, it's funny because I do, I think that especially this book, maybe partly because it's about this, you know, unusual but intense female friendship, it does, like reading the book has some of the flavor of having like, a very intimate conversation with a very smart friend, which is like maybe the highest compliment I can pay a book. <laughs> like, like all I want to do in life is like have intimate conversations with my smart friend. So, um, yeah, like I feel like that's such a that's such a gift to give people, especially now when when you know we often are not interacting in in real life with our friends. Um, wait, sorry, is there something before I ask you? Is there, do you want to respond to that? Or like, I I feel like you might be on the on the cusp of saying something. I, no, I I. The, the thing is that I, I feel with this book that it actually does come out of um, my smart friends, my women friends with mm. whom I have those kinds of conversations all the time. Like there's no, it's not a comp, you know, these aren't composite characters, nor did one of them ask me to do this astonishing thing. Uh, but just the you know the humor for one for one thing mm -hmm. um and a certain kind of irreverence um you know it's just complete i just recognize i just recognize the women that i know and talk to all the time in those conversations and in the attitudes the general attitudes that they have towards things so that so you're, you're right it, it is like that again i didn't plan it i just have these characters and they were going to talk to each other but um you know, but it, it's it's very true to life. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I think I also appreciated, um, you know, like sort of uh, the depiction of a, of a friendship that that changes over time and sort of circles back on itself. Because I, I think the older I get, the more like, like almost like, oh, I thought that was a person that I knew 20 years ago, but then it turns out I know them again in a, in a slightly different way. But, you know, sort of part of it is that history we have together. And um, so one thing that I that I am kind of you know want to ask you about is because I do think of your books as being you know very sort of not only literary but kind of generally cultured and making references to like music or movies or books or um, do you feel that for you um, what you get from writing and reading are the same or, or overlapping or are those two things? Like is your, is your writing an extension of your being a reader or is it kind of completely different? Oh, I think it is an extension. And, um, you know, I, I also realized that, you know, in my, in my first book, um, I, haven't, I haven't read it for a very, very long time, but I, I, I do have references in there too, like uh, to, to reading and quotes of other writers and, um, but the thing is that that when when I was writing the friend, for example, um, there's not much going on in her life, right? She's got this dog. She's this dog has been given to her. She's trying to take care of the dog, but she's not going out. She's not doing anything. I mean, she's actually kind of, um, uh, you know, she's isolated with the dog. But you know, she she is she's supposed to be a writer. She's supposed to be a writing teacher. Um, so, you know, it, it only makes sense that when she looks at things and thinks about things, she would, you know, she, she would come up with, uh, you know, she'd say, well, that's like what so-and-so said about whatever. Um, so I felt like I had to make her, that narrator, I had to make her be a writer and sound like a writer and, you know, not by saying I, she sat down in her laptop, you know, but, but the kind You're of- Showing the fingers, like type, 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 typing. Exactly. But the kind of person 
um, who sees things in life and, and immediately makes a connection to something that, that, that she read, uh, because that's, that's what readers do, not just write, that's what readers do. I mean, and that is what writers do. And it came very naturally. Um, and, you know, the same thing with this, with this new book. Again, she's also a writer, you know, a writer who doesn't seem to be writing. Um, but, you know, she, she is somebody who uh, has spent, I mean, has spent so much of her life reading um, that, 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 that just is, that's just going to be there. I mean, it just, uh, you know, it's just completely natural to me to do that. Um, I mean, and if I, if I had a, you know, you know, I mean, to me, it's like if I was going to write a book about an athlete, you know, I mean, I would, I would have to have that athlete doing athletic thing, going to practice, I mean, doing certain things that, you know, or otherwise, you can't just say he's an athlete, right? Yeah, I mean, some, yeah. there has to be some kind of, game. and if you're saying that somebody is a writer and a reader, a literary person who teaches writing, whose, whose uh, circle is all writing, you know, then there has to be some evidence of, of that, that there has to be some, some reason for that. Um, so, yeah. So, well, in terms of, of being um, a, a reader and writer, when you are not um, promoting a book, you know, as obviously you're, you're doing now, um, do you have a sort of consistent writing schedule and or a consistent reading schedule? Or like what's a typical day in your in, in your life as a reader writer well i you know i i do i i haven't been able to write for quite some time most writers i know ha haven't i mean certainly not on on fiction i've managed to do i mean since the the, pan the lockdown happened i've i've managed to 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 write two long review essays but and and eight pages of a story that i couldn't bring myself to go on with um so this is a very odd time, but it, you know, and so it's actually been a long time. Uh, uh, you know, I, I finished this book last summer, so it's been a long time since I, you know, since I've been writing fiction. Um, so, but in in uh, in a better life, uh, I I just try to write every day, and um, at least for some time. I mean, I'm always working on something. That, that, that that's you know so so it does have that aspect of going going to a job i mean once i get started you know i don't have to force myself you know to to to, to work because that's you know because that's that's what i do and reading no i have no i just um i read whatever i want whenever i want um not according to any <laughs> any particular schedule except you know if i'm teaching a literature course then you know um I'll have my reading list and I have the, the work of my students and the theses of my students. But, um, you know, not, no, no special, I think that's a, what I love about reading. You know, I mean, the, 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 you have so many choices and, you know, there's just so much going on. Um, there's always something, there's always something great to read. Um, do you, well, it's interesting because in the book, some of the, you know, I think at least two of the characters who have been, you know, great readers in their lives are kind of saying, and, and this is, it's pre-pandemic, but, but people are certainly worrying about, you know, climate change in very intense ways inside the book. Um, and people are almost saying, you know, like I, I tried to read and it, it didn't do for me what it had always done. And have you had that experience during the pandemic or are you always able to find something that speaks to you? I have, um, I have had it during the pandemic like, like everyone I, I know, but even, even before that, I have, I have had that experience. This is why I said in the friend that rereading is a dangerous business. You know, uh, re -re particularly if you're rereading something that you really loved. So it, it has happened to me that um, that I, I reread something and I, I, I it doesn't it doesn't hold up. Um, and also there's there are times and I think that, you know, this is is one of them where um, where it's harder to find something. There is always something if you can find it, but where it, it's, it's harder to, um, to find something that, that uh, you know, that I'm, I'm really thrilled to be reading because of, you know, uh, 
because it completely takes me out of myself or something. But um, I also think, I'm, I'm quite sure of this, because I think it, it really happens to lots of people that, um, uh, you know, people as they get older, they, you know, they, they, they get narrower in that sense. There are, there are fewer things, you know, people who read poetry and fiction all their lives after a certain point, they don't read poetry and fiction anymore. They just read nonfiction. Um, you know, I don't see that happening to me, but I do think that, um, you know, that there's a, it, 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 it isn't even, I mean, it's not like a, a laziness. It's more like a, 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 a greater focus. You know, it, it, the, 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 the woman who has, who is terminally ill in, in what are you going through? Um, I mean, she, she, she can't, concentrate anymore and um and she there's you know she doesn't seem you know she, she discovers that there are a lot of things that she loved that she just doesn't seem to care about anymore she most books are leaving her cold uh she used to love listening to music that's a problem for her too um she likes being in nature she's very happy watching buster keaton um, but, you know, I think that that's a, I think that that's a natural thing for somebody who's very ill, but I also think it's something that happens as people get older, that they, that they are, they're, they're less, less and less interested. It, they, you know, they don't have that broad taste and the desire to, to read everything that you have when, when you're young or yeah. younger. Um, well, so by the way, I, in, I, I think maybe in a couple minutes, I'll, I'll switch and ask you audience questions, but um, just a, a couple more. Um, do you have any recommendations? Like, is there anything that you've read during the pandemic that has been particularly transporting or consuming um, in, in the way that, you know, we always hope for with, with every book we read? Well, I, I actually reread a very beautiful book, uh, which I, read I guess um, uh, when it around when it came out it came out in, it came out in January 2019 it's called Unquiet by Lynn Ullman uh, the daughter of Ingmar Bergman and Liv mm. Ullman and it's um you know she she has an international reputation though she's not that well known in the in the United States um, but she was you know she's a writer she's she's written her whole life and um, she's written several novels of, in which the last thing she wants to talk about are these extraordinarily famous parents. Um, but then, you know, uh, Ingmar, Ingmar Bergman was getting very old and, and, and weak and losing his faculties. And she decided to write this book uh, that is auto fiction. And it's kind of a hybrid um, memoir novel. It's just, it's just a very, very beautiful, exciting book. And her parents are in there, she doesn't name them. It's called Unquiet, and that uh, I found that very, very soothing and compelling, and completely, you know, I'd forgotten a lot of it because I'm so distracted, and it, it completely pulled me in. I was, I was delighted with it. Oh, good. Okay, and I can see that um, that Politics and Prose just sort of posted a link to that. So, since since you brought up auto fiction. Um, I mean, I guess, do, will you, do you think that I, I, sometimes I myself think, what is the definition of auto fiction? And, you know, is it sort of a fiction memoir hybrid? Would you characterize um, what are you going through or the friend as auto fiction or, or not at all? Well, no, because, because um, the closest thing I've ever written to auto fiction is my first book. Mm -hmm. uh, the narrator is not named, but, but is clearly the author. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the, I mean, I, I took a lot of liberties, but you know, it, it meant that book could have been published as nonfiction. I mean, um, uh, you know, that, 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 that is my father, that is my mother. Um, mm -hmm. And, but nobody called it auto fiction then, mm -hmm. but, but, but that book, that, that, that book, is um so it would be like autobiographical fiction which i don't is auto fiction is not short for autobiographical is it no, or but is it okay but in auto fiction uh usually the, the narrator you know like like ben learner's narrator is yeah. named ben learner i mean that you know um uh okay so but in the friend and uh what are you going through none of that happened to me 
Yeah. It's not autobiographical. I did not, I did not, a friend did not commit suicide and leave me a dog. And I, and a friend did not say, will you, will you be with me during my last day? I mean, so, so it's, it's, it's not there. I mean, there's no, it's just, there's, you know, it's not autobiographical at all. Yeah. Um, what there is though, what's auto fictional, if you want to call it that there is that I am very identified with the narrator, the way the narrator sees the world, observes things, her take on things, um, not all of it, but a great deal of it, uh, you know, and above all, her sensibility, you know, that that's me in those in those two books, you know, so there there is that. But I mean, you couldn't, you can't call it auto fiction if, if, it, if it's, you know, if it's a uh, pure fiction. Right? If it's fiction, yeah. Well, it's, although, okay, and then this will be my last question. I'll turn to the audience. So if you type, type your questions in the Q&A, if you have questions. Um, I guess the question would be, my question would be, um, did you feel any temptation to like give the protagonist a name that wasn't yours or like almost like do something that would clearly, um, you know, make people know that it's not you because, because it is written in such a um, sort of plausible way or did you did you want there to be this ambiguity or did you just feel like you know you wrote the way that served the story well i i, I mean i i feel like it there's something it there's just a um you know in my first book as i say there, there was no need it was it was very obviously the eye was cigarette um and um but with these these other books um you know, and nobody ha ha has a name in these books, um, except for the dog. Meaning the other characters, yeah, yeah. And, you know, there again, no, without planning anything, when I started writing, there actually, I actually, the friend, there were names, there were a couple of names of characters in there, and it just sounded so fake and awkward. I mean, they uh -huh. were fake and, 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 and they were, it, it was impeding me, you know, um, mm. inhibiting me. Uh, I got rid of the names and then, you know, did whatever I had to do to, you know, get through the, the, the story without, without giving them names. And since that didn't work for me in The Friend, when I started writing this book, I didn't even think about it. I, I knew that I, I was going to do the same thing with, the, with people not having names. But with like auto fiction, for example, you think of somebody like Sheila Hetty, yeah. um, the person, me in motherhood. You know, it's it's very clear. She, she she refers to herself as Sheila. It's a you know it's a, and it is it is auto fiction. It's a completely different thing. Um, so anyway, yeah yeah okay. I'm gonna click. I'm gonna sort of awkwardly click on the Q and A and see. Okay, so um, so someone says um, I have a cover of Poets and Writers magazine here with your picture on the cover and an article titled. The Secret Facts of Fiction from January, February, 2006. That's a, a magazine hoarder after my own heart. Um, how have your stories and your approach to storytelling changed since that time? Since, um, since January, February, 2006. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I, I you know, uh, whatever books I've written since then have been, have been, you know, different from, um, well, what was I even, why, why were they even, why was I even, what, was <laughs> what happened in, in early, do you, did you have a book come out? Oh, wait, was it like, um, The Last of Her Kind. Yeah, I think I was gonna say, I, I remember, I lived in Philadelphia when The Last of Her Kind came out, I remember, re so yeah, that would have been, that, that checks out. <laughs> yeah, so, so, someone so, confirmed. So, well, since, since then, I wrote a completely different novel about a flu pandemic. Oh. Salvation City, which, that was very different, and that was that was the central character was a, was a, a boy instead of a, a, a woman as usual, and not in the first person. And then I wrote a memoir, which is not a story, um, uh, about Susan Sontag. And then um, you know, then then I wrote the friend in this book, which are, which really are quite different. So I'd, I would say that um, from the last of her kind, I would say that. Um, that the the books have gotten um, shorter and more and more intimate, um, but uh, at the, but it's not it's not I haven't really changed my approach to storytelling because I, I always just sort of you know I just start writing. Um, I will ask like how how does it feel to have written a novel about a pandemic? You know, 
what 12 years or something before before there was a pan- like do you and somebody else actually said something like um that the last of her of her kind has a final sentence referring to the looming Trump Tower and then says, did you know something that, that we didn't know? I mean, I don't know. Do you do you feel that that you or writers have a kind of like prescience or? Writers do, I think, Writer, writers do. They pay attention to the world in a certain way and think about it. And uh, and some things are very predictable. I mean, I, I um, it was, it was, it was really, uh, you know, people keep saying, Bill Gates predicted this pandemic. Bill Gates predicted this pandemic. No, he didn't. Everybody, I mean, anybody paying attention, Dr. Fauci used to talk about this, right? It's not a question of if, but when. I mean, my whole life, I've thought that some at some point during my lifetime, there was likely to be a, a flu pandemic. That's what, another pandemic like 1918. And so that's all, you know, I've always thought of that. And then, you know, I remember reading that Mary McCarthy lost both of her, she was a child and she lost both of her parents in that flu and William Maxwell lost his mother in that flu. And there were many, many, many orphans. Um, So I just thought that I wanted to write about that and and about one of those orphans, but it was now, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't about the future, you know, it wasn't just, it was a what if novel. Um, And the, and the thing about Trump Tower, it was, um, you know this person uh, who who, um, who who came to Manhattan to go to go to school, you know, at at, at the age of, of, of eighteen, and and um, and had and then lived in Manhattan and all kinds of feelings about it, um, and about how things had changed. And she she talked at a certain point about going to Bonwit Teller, the, the department store there. And so at the end, she's saying, and now we're we're bo- this has changed, that has gone, this has changed, and where Bonwit Teller stood is now Trump Tower. So that's how, how that happened. I didn't, you know, I didn't, there was no prediction either, but anyway, okay. So what, uh, other questions? Okay. Um, so this is um, a question, a questioner named Victor says, um, when you are writing and strongly identify with the book's narrator, are there certain pitfalls, caveats, or lessons that you have learned along the way? Wait, if in in when you when when writing strongly identify, are there certain pitfalls? Yeah, I guess are there certain do's or don'ts when you're writing a narrator who's close to yourself? Yeah, there are there are there are a lot of them, but they come up along the way, so it's sort of hard to. Um, well, you know, one one really important one is that you, uh, you know, you worry about you worry about about uh, uh, coming across as self you know self absorbed and narcissistic, right? <laughs> um, that's that's that can be a problem. Another problem is if you're if if it's if you are strongly if if it's clear to the reader how strongly you are identified with the um, with the narrator, you know, there's the, the you know you would you would never want to give the sense that you were settling scores in your real life mm-hmm. or that you, uh, you know, that there's, that there's a, you have a, 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 you know, one of your motives is revenge of some kind um, or, or, you know, I mean, cause, because, it, because people don't really care. I mean, they don't, they don't, they, they, they're not reading your book. I mean, they, they, they don't care, care how much you've suffered and how bad things have been and how people have mistreated you. They're buying the book for a whole other reasons and um, you know it's it's very it's very easy to lose a reader's sympathy, and that's not the reader's fault. That's your fault. So I think you know having a certain kind of respect for the reader, and understanding that the, that you know even though this might be autobiographical or you're identified with you know it doesn't it's, you can't treat the reader like a therapist or like a captain. <laughs> right? I, you're there. The re, you're there to please the reader. You know, that's what you're trying to do. It's about the reader. It's not. It's not about you. And if you keep that in mind, um, I, I think that that can really help you avoid all kinds of problems. That's interesting because I I think that I agree with you, but I don't often hear other writers say that. Like I think I think that sometimes there's almost this idea that it's very pure to like 
not think of the reader when when you're writing and you know almost just <laughs> listen only to your own artistic inner voice um okay so this is this is a completely different topic someone says how do you feel about writers groups are they helpful stuffy inspiring <laughs> or demoralizing <laughs> Well, it depends on the group, I guess. Are you in one or what? what's your process of giving and getting feedback? I don't, um, I don't, I don't do that. See, I'm, as a matter of fact, I never show anything that I've written to anyone until the book is finished or the story or whatever, until it's finished, completely finished. Um, you know, and then I, I give it to my agent, I give it to my editor. Um, that's it. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't share work. Uh, really? People. You show it to no one besides your agent and editor? Really? To begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is there, you know, is it, is there sort of a logic for why, or do you just feel like, why would I show it to anyone else? Well, I guess I, uh, you know, and I, and I don't belong to a writer's group and I wouldn't belong to a writer's group because the whole point of that is to share your work. Um, I just find that it would be confusing to me. I, you know, I don't, um, if it's in progress in particular, it's a, it's a very fragile thing and you're very, you know, like, and if, if, if different people are reading it and giving different opinions, um, you know, that can really, that can really throw you. But I have to say also, I feel like I, I, I like to keep my own counsel. I feel like I know better, you know? I, I know, I'm because I'm writing it and I do have experience and I also have certain ideas in my head so you might not see it. I mean, I feel very, I feel very strange saying this and very guilty because I do teach, I do teach workshops, um, you know, where this is exactly what we do. But there are reasons why we do it, and there are reasons why people want to take uh, be in creative writing programs, and I, I, do, I do the best I can, I promise. But I do have, but I don't, I don't, but it's, but I, I but I don't actually. Um, I've just never been someone who, um, you know, who have, who has who has wanted to do that until it was until it was finished. Um, do you do you say to your students sort of like? heads up this is this is only one way of doing things and you know you you don't have to get all this feedback along the way well actually i discovered i discovered that at, at you know at a certain point where i i i said um you know with, with certain classes where i said uh you know the writer who's being workshopped uh you you don't you don't have to you're not you're not obliged to get you know, the other 14 people's uh, copies of your manuscript with their comments. Um, but they they all always wanted it. They, you know, they if somebody was going to read their work and say something about it, they, they wanted to know that. Um, I would not want to know it. See, that's, that's the difference. Um, <laughs> I respect that. I mean, I, yeah. And I don't, I don't think you're alone. I don't, I think it's unusual, but I don't think you're alone, like in, in yeah. not, not doing, you know, sort of. Yeah. So, so, you know, so obviously there's a, there's a, there's a value, you know, to the, to the, to the writer to want to see what, you know, their, their, their peers are, are, are thinking of their work. Um, anyway. Um, okay, another question. Someone says, this is an anonymous questioner, says, I believe um, you're coming to us from New York City. How are you finding the city these days? Will conditions there today inspire your next book? Um, I, I, yeah, I am in New York and I've been here um, since lockdown. Uh, and, you know, things have gotten better here. That, you know, we're, we're, we were at the peak of our crisis earlier in the spring. In early summer, and we've had a, an intelligent uh, reopening. Um, so we, we we feel optimistic about that. Worried about a second wave. We're worried about schools reopening and 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 that causing a spike in infections and, and the infection rate and so on. I did. Um, I I did when I the story that I mentioned. When I said I I, I had hadn't gotten any fiction writing done since the pandemic began. The story that I started writing, I got about eight pages into it, and um, and it was about the the current moment. Um, 
and I, I wasn't able to go on with it. So I don't know. I mean, I think that this, everything that's happening to all of us right now is so extreme and, 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 and constantly changing and, and so unsettling all these things that I, I, um, I can't imagine that whatever I write in the future won't be about it to some extent, but it's, you know, Every, with everything changing and me changing too, I can't. I have no idea what um, you know. If none of this had happened, I think I, I would. I probably would be, you know, in the middle of something right now. But it just, uh, you know, it's just, that's it's just not going to work um, right now. So I have no idea. I don't know when I'll write again or or or, or what I'll write. Um, and I know that it will be much affected by what's going on. But I, I doubt if it will be directly about directly about the about uh, the pandemic yeah yeah it will be interesting i mean i think to, to sort of see in the coming years you know because because it's such a universal experience i mean like the particulars are different but everyone has been affected by it um it, it will be interesting to see like how that sort of body of literature emerges um okay Let's see, um, this is Kay says, do you have a favorite among the books you have written? A favorite book, this is, the, and then question part two is, a favorite book you didn't write? Um, I don't, for, you know, for, there was a long period of time where I would say that the, it, that the, my favorite among my books was this book for Rowena about the uh, woman who served in Vietnam because I thought it was my best book, by which I meant I thought that it came closest to achieving what I really wanted to do. And then, then I would think, well, maybe it's not my best, maybe it's not my favorite, but, but I go back and forth with that and I seem to come back to that with that particular book. Um, but now maybe, you know, in, in the usual way, the one that you wrote most recently is the favorite. Um, so maybe maybe this is this is the favorite for right now. Um, a favorite book I didn't write, I suppose, meaning by another writer or or a favorite book. I know. I, maybe either one. I, it seems very open to interpretation. Uh, it's a favorite book by another writer. I don't actually. You know, people. Uh, it's a question that people get asked all the time. You know, they want people want lists of you know your your you know the the best books you ever read your your favorite movies your favorite whatever and i'm always sort of astonished that anybody can talk about their favorite book or writer because there's so much and they're the writers and books are so different one from another so i don't really have favorites i just have lots and lots and lots of of, of work that i love and writers that i love and i tend to if i'm if i'm reading something really good um that tends to be my 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 favorite you know for the for the moment so i don't you know i don't i don't actually have you know a favorite a favorite book yeah um all right let's have maybe one more question this is this this person is very lucky because she says sigrid you are my favorite author it's her name is elizabeth um, i am thrilled for these online events i'm floored to hear you say recently that you had no experience with nursing or vietnam how did you write for ruena it was fully convincing how much research did that take how did that story come to you? I'm, by the, I'm so excited to be, to be the, the liaison between <laughs> Elizabeth and her favorite author. That's so exciting. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> see, and I think, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I often go back to saying that's my best book or that's my, my favorite of my books because I remember the experience of writing that book was really kind of overwhelming. Um, you know, I came of age during the war uh, you know, I knew people who, who'd been there, but, but no, no woman who'd served. Um, I guess it was at a certain point I had read some oral histories of nurses who'd, who'd served in Vietnam. This was um, maybe in the, in the early 80s or so that I, I might have read these. And I was kind of stunned. Uh, it was utterly fascinating to me. And I thought I would love to write this. And then, you know, like, many, many years later, when it was time to write a, a new novel, um, I, um, I thought I'm, I'm going to do this. And so uh, I did what I hadn't done um, before. I, I had I'd, I'd avoided all the films and there are a lot of them and some of them are quite good. So I saw all the films and then I read 
you know, all these works uh, about about Vietnam, about having served there, about, you know, I mean, just whatever. I mean, um, what is the name of that Michael Hare book? Um, oh, I don't. Well, somebody knows because I, I, I bet I bet politics and prose can post it under in the chat. Michael Hare. Um, it's H E R R. Is that how you spell his last name? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, he was a journalist. He was he was covering the war. Oh, di dispatches. Of course. Oh, how can I forget? This is like one of my favorite books ever. One of the greatest books ever, and it's not like any other book. And he was a journalist covering um, a Vietnam for Esquire. Um, so that kind of thing, all, all, all kinds of things. And I just, um, and then I just, you know, I just had to use my imagination. I, I was nervous about it, but I, I, I you know, I, I, I have heard from people who, who served and, 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 and people who were nurses and, and uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's possible, you know, you don't really have to have the experience yourself. I did not talk to, uh, I did not interview uh, nurses who'd serve because they tend to be, they do not really like like to be bothered, frankly, and I, and I wouldn't have bothered them. Ha! Um, <laughs> um, well, okay, wait, I think we turn it back over to Lindsay. I, so I just want to say on, on behalf of, um, you know, your many fans, thank you so much for this conversation tonight. Thank you so much for writing. What are you going through? Um, you know, we, we wish you all good things with it. It's a delight to see you again. Um, Sigrid, I hope we see each other in person. Lindsay, do you, I don't know if there's any housekeeping, do you come back? What, what happens next? Yeah. <laughs> What's the um, dismount? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much. Um, as a final parting, we always like to ask our authors if you guys are reading anything great. I know you both have recommended a ton of books, but if there are any others you would like to shout out before we go, either of you. Oh my God, I always, this, this always, I'm, I'm not in my like speak mode, you know, like I'm not in my question answer. I do, I'm reading Luster right now, which, you know, so are a lot of people, but, um, but I think, do you say her name, Raven Lilani? I think is I how you say it. Yeah, it's very. Um, it's... I read I um a, a book that I read um again I'm rereading because I read it when it was in manuscript um by Peter Cameron called uh, What Happens at Night. It came out in August, I believe. It's a very very it's a novel. It's 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 fantastic. It's just beautiful and strange. Um, so there's another another book. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. Um, and for everybody watching, just a final reminder that your book sales and your patronage of our store is what allows us to bring you these amazing events and programming. Um, so please support Sigrid, Curtis, and Politics and Prose by using the links in the chat um, to purchase What Are You Going Through and Rodham. You can also check our website for our upcoming events. We have an amazing listing coming up. And we hope to see y'all on our screens in the future. Um, thank you all so much. And once again, thank thank you, Sigrid, and thank you, Curtis. See y'all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.